So hello and welcome back to part two of chapter six of Lioness Rampant by Tamora Pierce. I hope everybody is doing really good and I'm, I'm doing a, more of that self-indulgent thing where I just talk into the microphone over video footage of me drawing something and in this case it's just me finishing up the uh the tote bag of my cute little bookworm or at least I think he's cute anyway if you remember in part one we were kind of just catching up on everything Alana came into contact with Duke Roger again Jonathan is very happy to have her back, etc. and so on, and she was about to start catching up with Gary, Alex, Joffrey, and uh, Raul a little bit more, and she was telling them that she would have plenty of time to spin tales. So, let's jump back into part two of chapter six of Lioness Rampant by Tamora Pierce. As they talked, she examined each face. Alex was as closed as ever, although he seemed pleased about something. Gary stopped to think before he spoke, so he wasn't as sarcastic as he used to be. Miles had said that Gary had taken up Duke Garrett's duties. Alana thought the responsibility was good for her friend. Even Joffrey seemed sharper, more honed. He told Alana that Scar and Raiders kept him hopping all winter on the northern borders. Come on, Alan, uh, Alana, he corrected himself as the rest laughed. Let's see if you're still in shape. He tossed her a wooden sword. Of course she's in shape, Gary said. I doubt that she did much fencing, though, with the Shang Dragon, Alex commented. When Alana looked at him to see if he meant something nasty, he said, I know that Iron Arm prefers hand-to-hand -hand techniques over weapons. Alana hefted the practice sword, testing its weight. That doesn't mean that he avoids weapons. Gary, Raoul, and Alex sat on the railings to watch. Is it true that Saren is a shambles? Gary called as Alana and Joffrey squared off. Yes, Alana said, sidestepping Joffrey's lunge and engaging his blade, twisting down and up. He freed his sword and darted backwards, looking at her with respect. Alana concentrated, knowing that she was being tested to see if she had changed. From what people had said the night before, she knew that Jonathan needed her as a knight to point out to the skeptics that his vassals were loyal and strong. That she was female was a source of trouble, but she could balance that by proving, here and now, that her abilities were the same. Joffrey came in with a series of chopping blows, trying to limit her to defense. She slid away and kept him turning. He faltered, and she darted in, her sword coming to rest at the base of his throat. Joffrey lowered his blade. I had forgotten how God's cursed fast you are, he said. Gary climbed down. My turn. Alana got into position. Part of her was aware that the servants and nobles were coming into the yard to watch. With a grim smile, she went to work, forcing Gary to attack. She beat him with a disarm like the one that she had tried on Joffrey, hooking his sword away from his hands. Raoul did not last as long as Gary. He wasn't really trying, and she told him that. I'm used to being beaten by you, he told her with a smile. It's hard to change an old habit. And from all the evidence, I needn't bother. You're still the best, except maybe for Alex. He nodded at the dark young man who was seated on the railing. Come on, Alex. Give the lioness a try. The hair on the back of Alana's neck stood up. It was weird to hear her war name on an old friend's lips. It told her, more than anything that she had seen or heard, just how much she had gotten away from her fellow knights. Alex shook his head. 
I want to catch the lady knight when she's fresh. His eyes met Alana's with an expression that she couldn't read. Some other time, I promise. Others volunteered, eager to try a pass or two. Alana had another five practice bouts before she bowed out. She was getting hot. The men and boys protested her departure, but she noticed that they began to fill the courts as soon as she stepped out of hers. I should be flattered that they held off practice to watch me, she thought, taking a towel. Gary walked her to the stables, an arm around her shoulders. Were the last two even Tortolan? Alana said, wiping her face. No. Gary was pleased. One was Gallen, and the other one was Karthaki. They're here for the coronation. It's a bit early, aren't they? Everyone wants to know what Jonathan's like. They particularly want to know if he will be king for long. That's why it's good to have you home. Most of us younger knights aren't known outside of Tortal, but the lioness is known and respected. A king who commands your loyalty is worth paying attention to. They reached the stable doors. Turning red, Alana said, Hogwash. To you, it's hogwash, Gary agreed, but to foreigners, it's important. They will keep their fingers out of our business until they know more about Jonathan. With a cheerful salute, he left her and returned to the palace and his duties. Entering the stables, Alana found them deserted. Most of the hostlers were in the courtyards or the paddocks, which suited her. Putting her fingers to her lips, she gave an ear-splitting whistle. A stocky man slipped down from the haymow, not bothering to pick the dried grass from his straw-like hair. So there you are, Stefan commented, bowing and tugging his forelock. It's that good to see you. Mayhap now his majesty will perk up. It's been that gloomsome, Mistress Alana. Alana leaned up against a post. Why don't you tell me what's actually going on to make things so gloomsome? Stefan looked around warily. Come on up, he invited, climbing a ladder to the haymow, and keep your voice down. Upon her return to House Alau, Alana found the premises occupied by seamstresses. It was Eleni's idea, Burry said. She said that you and Fayette need dresses. Good luck. Faithful saw the welther of fabrics and the earnest-looking women and fled with Burry. The men had already vanished. I know that you would rather do other things today, Eleni explained, as she hauled Alana into the fitting room. But His Majesty wants you to bring Thayat to court tonight. He left you this. She handed over a parchment. Breaking the seal, Alana read John's note while George's mother divested her of her sword, her belt, her tunic, and her boots. Lady Knight. Tonight would be a good time to present you officially at court and to formally introduce Princess Thayette. The longer, the more conservative souls have to get used to you, the more productive your presence will be. This will also be an excellent opportunity, with so many to witness, for you to present me with the object that we spoke of. Alana nodded in approval of Jonathan's strategy as she threw the note into the fire. A formal introduction was a grand occasion. Foreign diplomats and Tortolan nobles alike would be there. By virtue of her rank, Thayette was due a reception like that, even though the court was in mourning. While Alana preferred an informal welcome, she knew that it would be easier if Jonathan gave her public approval. Also, giving him the jewel would help both her and him. No one would wish to dethrone a king who held the jewel, and once presented, word would get around, the sooner the better after all the news she had heard today. With a sigh, she removed her shirt and her breeches as an assistant came to take her measurements with a knotted cord. Grimly, she looked at the ceiling while the cord snaked all around her body. 
The fitting was almost over, though, before it began, when the chief seamstress showed Alana dress designs. I won't wear a gown. Not tonight, she said firmly. They will think I'm crawling back with my tail between my legs. You can't be showing your, whole, your legs to the whole court and his majesty, said the seamstress. It's indecent and it's disrespectful and all the nobles will talk about you. They already do that, Alana told her. The woman shook her head stubbornly. The only ladies as wears hose are thems that's no better than they ought to be. Ripsa turned with a laugh and then a cough when the seamstress glared at her. I'm not a lady. I'm a knight, Alana said, and I am making my bow to the court as a knight. Dresses are fine sometimes, but not tonight. Sir Alana is right, and you're right, Fayette said. She held up a sketch that she had been working on. Is this a suitable compromise? With a bit of gold or maybe a silver stripe along the seam, Eleni suggested as the seamstress frowned. Alana took a look. It was a shirt and tunic with soft, full breeches instead of hose. The tunic was longer than usual, coming to the knee, yet splits in the sides all the way to the waist ensured the wearer's freedom of movement. Is it all right? Alana or Thad asked. I think I like it, said Alana. Hmm, the seamstress commented, still very skeptical. Ripsa put a friendly arm around the woman's shoulders and said, the dark gray silk with Oh, of course, I can see where it might be too much trouble, though, with Princess Thayette's and Mistress Cooper's ball gowns. Maybe Mistress Weaver, uh, the one with the shop over in... Oh, no, it's no trouble, said the seamstress, pulling out of Ripsa's hands. No trouble at all, for a shop of the fir finest cut like mine. So, if you hear banging in the background, it's, uh fireworks. Of course it's fireworks. <laughs> it's not that I actually object to fireworks. I just object to them when we haven't had rain in what feels like forever. Anyway, back to the book. All right. It's no trouble, snapped the seamstress, pulling out of Ripsa's hold. No trouble at all for a shop of the first cut like mine. <laughs> Weaver. She sells inferior cloth and stitching that comes undone at the first bow. Ripsa winked at Alana, and the skirmish was settled with honor to both sides. The gleam in Eleni's Al eyes made Alana uncomfortable. George's mother was looking her over inch by inch, leaving no part of Alana unscrutinized. Alana quickly began to dress. Earrings, the older woman said. Alana forgot her trepidation and looked at Eleni, hardly believing her ears. Could I? she whispered. All of her life she had envied the court beauties with their eardrops, to the point that she had refused to get the single earring that a man normally wore. It just wasn't the same. In a twinkle, Eleni and Fayette had her in a chair while Ripsa was heating a needle. This shouldn't be any trouble at all, the redhead said, being as how you're a blooded knight. Now hold still. Alana gritted her teeth as the needle punched into her earlobe. The bottom dropped out of her stomach and her ears began to roar. I'll tell you what the daughters told me when I had mine done, Fayette said as Ripsa replaced the needle with a bit of silk. Beauty is pain. Is that supposed to be some sort of a consolation? said Alana. She closed her eyes against the next punch of the needle. This time, the bottom of her stomach continued to drop, and the roar was deafening. She opened her eyes into more blackness. Someone was waving aromatic salts under her nose. Alana sneezed and then sneezed again. What happened? She said, struggling to keep her stomach in place. 
Ripsa stopped trying to fight the laughter, and Eleni wiped tears from her eyes with a handkerchief. Even the seamstress showed signs of amusement. Alana fixed Thayette with a look. Thayette? You fainted, the princess gasped, and then surrendered to whoops of mirth. Ripsa and Eleni told the travelers what had been going on in the palace in the city while the seamstress was working nearby. The picture drawn for Alana was grim, grimmer than she had thought from the recital out in the stable. Jonathan's future subjects wondered if he was cursed. Duke Gareth had taken the deaths of his sister and brother-in-law hard, and he was in retirement and Gary was virtually the Prime Minister. No one questioned Gary's ability, but everyone had known and respected his father, and few people outside of the palace had ever met the younger Gary Naxon. Many of the older nobles, who normally could be relied upon to support the king, had withheld support from Jonathan without giving a reason. Their excuse was that they were waiting for the coronation, which was the proper time and place, but Miles and Duke Gareth told Jonathan that those same lords had pledged to support his father before his coronation. Claw appeared to have vanished, but Alana knew from Stefan that his followers were still making trouble for George. A wet spring and a cool summer this far, or thus far, made for sickly crops, which was a bad omen in a king's first year on the throne. Everyone's waiting to see which way the cat's going to jump, Ripsa said, as Alana submitted to her fitting, with no reason at all. They're hoping for another claimant to the throne, but who could it be? The Conti Duke is giving them no encouragement, that's for certain. With some... All it took was the Bazir coming here in large numbers, Eleni said. Plenty of Southerners hate them, and any king liked by the desert men will find he's got some trouble. Some folks say that Duke Roger is older and more experienced than Jonathan, Ripsa added. They say what happened two midwinters ago, she nodded to Alana was John's plot to get Roger out of the way. Easy, child, Eleni said, putting a hand on Alana's arm. It's just talk. No one's doing anything, not even speaking out publicly. But Jonathan could use a miracle. To her surprise, Alana smiled. Well then, we'll just give him one. Later, Alana found Miles in his study that afternoon, taking a nap. Once he was awake, Alana sat down to discuss the events of the last year with him. He could fill in the blank spaces because he knew better than anyone else why nobles behaved the way they did, and his merchant friends were always honest with him. They don't think that Jonathan can hold the throne, he told Alana. Until they see proof that he can, they're going to hold back. It isn't that any of them expect Roger to try for the throne. Well, those who live at court don't expect it. But Tortle's a big kingdom, and it's hard to keep it knit together in the best of times. If Jonathan can't rule, the fiefs on the borders will start to break away and form their own kingdoms. Tusain, Gala, and Skarna will nibble away at the edges. That's what people fear. The old king let them be, and twenty-some years of that sort of beneficent neglect is bearing fruit now. Does that answer your question? Alana nodded. The jewel will help. After that, it's up to Jonathan and the use that he makes of you bright young people. Alana laughed. Don't forget that he's got you as well. Miles chuckled. By the way, I have something for you. Eleni told me that you had an ordeal this afternoon. I bought these to make you feel better. His hand dug into his pocket and he handed Alana a small box. 
don't open it here. Expressions of gratitude just embarrass me. He leaned back in his chair, putting up his feet. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to finish my nap. Outside of the study, Alana opened the box. Inside was a pair of black pearl ear bobs. Every Tortolan girl dreamed of descending the great stair in the Queen's ballroom with all eyes on her and the night of her dreams signaling her out and bearing her away to a life of bliss. Minstrels made their living off of tales of common-born girls presented at court by mysterious wealthy guardians for just that fate. Now it was Alana's turn to descend. She felt a degree of panic that she was unaccustomed to, since she was used to the palace. She had seen hundreds descend the great stair to cross the long room and kneel before the sovereigns. In the ballroom, she had met girls who had come to court to make good marriages, foreign diplomats and their ladies, merchants, visiting warriors, the list went on and on. If they had been as terrified as she was right now, none of them had shown it. They stood in the chambers outside of the ballroom's great doors, Thayette, Burry, Eleni, and Liam for official presentation. Miles was there to bolster their confidence and Alana to be, what, reintroduced? That can't be right, she told herself. The jewel was snug in its box and it seemed to have ca caught her case of nerves. She could feel the jewel humming through her gloves. Jump up, she told Faithful, wriggling her shoulder. I need the reassurance. No, the cat said, shaking his head. I'll just muss up your pretty clothes. Startled, she pulled away. He actually sounded serious. Elaine Cooper fussed with the gold lace at her throat. I wish I hadn't agreed to this. <sighs> Miles... She was looking quite elegant, in mahogany-colored silk, her gray-streaked hair in a heavy knot at the back of her head. I am suitably entertained down in the lower city, you know that. Hazel eyes met hazel eyes with a depth of love that made Alana wistful as Miles raised Elaine's hands to his lips. This will be just as entertaining. Perhaps even more, my dear. Strong fingers brushed Alana's new ear bobs. Pretty, said Liam. A nice touch. Alana's heart skipped a beat. The dragon did not have to wear dark colors or pale grays or lavenders of mourning for the king and queen. He was magnificent in blue-violet satin over silvery shirt and hose. His hair flamed in contrast. It's not fair of you to look so good, Alana said. I could say the same about you. You think that I don't have regrets about us breaking it off. His eyes were the bright aqua, and he seemed to have reserved that color just for her. When you're queen of Tortle, though, you'll thank me. She was about to open her mouth and say, I'm not going to be queen, when Gary joined them. Liam Ironarm? I'm Gareth, Gary the Younger of Naxon. My father's the Prime Minister. Can you tell me about Shang? He put his arm through Liam's and walked him away, say, calling back over his shoulder, I'll talk to you later, Alana. Timon. Once Duke Gareth's personal manservant, now chief of the palace footmen, arrived, looking harassed. Gary bade a swift farewell and went to stand by the throne. Timon nodded to Miles, who took Eleni's arm. You are worth any of these women, Mistress Cooper, Alana heard Miles whisper. The chief herald bowed and opened the door, admitting the couple. Am I all in one piece? Burry wanted to know. She wore a deerskin jacket that was richly beaded in red and silver, tight deerskin breeches and soft boots. 
She bristled with silver and black daggers. Both the short and long sword were strung at her waist. Her thick hair was tightly braided and coiled up. The pins that secured it were silver. She slapped black gauntlets nervously on her arm as Alana looked her over. Alana smiled. You look splendid. Your mother and brother would be proud. We're proud, Liam said. The herald beckoned him, and he drew a deep breath. Shang Masters, I hate this sort of thing. Leaving the women staring at him in astonishment, he went through the door. Burry poked Alana's arm. Thayette had emerged from the robing room. Alana's voice caught as the princess tried to smile. Do I look all right? Thayette's hair was a mass of ringlets cascading from crown to shoulders. Her hazel eyes were big against her creamy skin. Her lips were crimson. Her flame-red gown left shoulders and an expansive bosom glowing against the muslin and then blossomed out into a wide skirt. Rubies set in lacy gold shimmered in her hair and against her neck. The chief herald stared at Thad as well. Don't ask me, Alana said with a smile. That one there, he's seen all the beauties come and go. He told me that they don't impress him anymore. Thayette looked over at the chief herald. He bowed to her as deeply as he would to a king. Princess, may you always grace our halls, he said. Both doors at the head of the stairs swung open. The silence in the crowded ballroom was abrupt. Both doors were used only for visiting royalty. The herald walked to the head of the stairs and struck his iron-shod staff three times. Her Most Royal Highness, Princess Thayette Gian Wilma of Sarin, Duchess of Camus and Thaelin. Alana walked forward with Thayette on her arm. Sir Alana of Trabond and Alau, Knight of the Realm of Tortal, Burian Torkun of the Khmeri Huma tribe. Jonathan rose then, watching them. The awestruck look on his face was all Alana needed to see. She gave herself a pat on the back for an idea well conceived. Thayette descended the stair as though floating, her face impassive. Only her very tight, somewhat damp grip on Alana's arm revealed how nervous she was. Jonathan walked down the scarlet runner between the door and the throne to meet them at the center of the ballroom. Alana gently withdrew her arm from Thayette's clutches, leaving the princess to walk a the few steps to Jonathan alone. The king-to-be embraced Thayette gently and kissed her on both cheeks. Cousin, welcome, he said, using the form of a dress that was common to royalty. We regret the sad event that drove you from your home. Thank you, Your Majesty. Thayette's gaze was stern. Plainly, to Alana, she was trying to remind John of her wish to become a private subject. Jonathan ignored the hint. Until such time as peace returns to Sarin, know that Tortle is now your home. Offering Thayette his arm, he led her to the chair placed for her just below his own. She sat gracefully, her skirts settling around her feet in a perfect fan. Burry took up the station at her side. No one knew who began it, but a patter of applause turned into a roar of enthusiasm. In Sarin, Thayette was the female who should have been born a male heir, but the Tortolan courtiers accepted Thayette for who she was. George also enjoyed Thayette's entrance, but he was not blind to her companions. He nodded his approval to Burry, and he was acutely aware of Alana from the moment she had appeared. 
In her dark gray and black, she was elegant and somber, with her hair and eyes blazing. No one could miss the sword that was belted at her waist, and under one arm she carried a box not much bigger than her fist. Remembering his disguise, though, as a stern-faced Bazir, George defeated the urge to beam like a proud lover. She's done it, he thought. My darling has made them pay attention and dance to her tune, and I thought only commoners knew how to do that. Waiting for the applause to die back, Alana looked around. Even disguised, she knew George. She bit back a grin. She should have known that he would come, and she winked at him, enjoying the approval in his eyes. Behave, faithful scolded. You have business to take care of. The noise was finally dying. Jonathan nodded and said, Sir Alana, come forward. She continued down the carpet, hand on her sword hilt with Faithful beside her. Thayette smiled encouragingly as Alana knelt before Jonathan. Your Majesty. She drew lightning and laid it on the step at his feet as a token of her allegiance. This I swear, to serve you and your heirs with all I possess in the mother's name. Taking the box with both of her hands, she flipped it open. The jewel lay on a black velvet bed, and she held it up to him. I bring you the fruit of my traveling, your majesty, the dominion jewel. Jonathan reached for it as total silence fell. The moment his fingers touched the jewel, it flared to life, blazing like a small sun in his hand. Jonathan held it aloft, and first one courtier and then the next knelt until everyone except for Jonathan and Thayette was kneeling. We thank you, Sir Alana. His voice was audible in every corner of the room. And we praise the gods for sending us this jewel and our lioness in our time of need. And that is where the chapter ends. So I think we only have, what, two more chapters? Oh my gosh. But then again, they are very long chapters, so it'll probably be like four more nights. Yeah, we have two more chapters and an epilogue. So not a whole heck of a lot of book left for how thick of an amount of book is still left. So yeah, I hope that you enjoyed that. It was a really, really good chapter, I think. I do like the fact that our, our blooded lady knight, who has had sword wounds fainted when getting her ears pierced. So now we know two things that she's not good at. She's not good at dealing with minor pain, like ears getting pierced, and she's also not good with babies. So it's always good to know your limitations. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed watching me as I, uh, you know, did a little bit of, of art it's really funny to me just how much the line work kind of brings everything together when you're drawing. I mean, not, not every picture needs to be lined, but especially the cartoony stuff, it just looks so much better when you actually line it. And uh, that's kind of cool. Anyway, I'm going to zip this forward so you can see both of these as they are done. Now, these are potential prizes for the giveaway on that whole if and when I make the 2,000 subscriber thing. So, I think what I'm going to do when I get to 2,000 subscribers is, um, I think I am, oops, that was the wrong way. Yeah, good job, me. Anyway, what I think I'm going to do when I hit the 2,000 subscriber mark is just 
do probably a live stream and people will be able to pick oh my gosh why won't you just stay there there we go people will be able to pick the prizes that they want so i think i've got four bags done now and i'm probably going to do a couple more because it's fun anyway as always thank you so much for listening i really do appreciate it and i will see you next time have a good one